This is a Pinball News production. Please give a big applause for David Vanessa. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, I want to say thank you for bringing me to Holland. Um, a lot of people don't think I have a connection to Holland, but I do, and that's my father. And actually, him being here today, this is the first time he's ever actually seen the game physically. He also didn't know, just like you guys, that what I was doing for two years. So this is actually the first time he's seen the impact of what I've done. Um, big reason why I didn't tell him was I didn't want him to worry about setting up a pimple company. And I think a lot of you guys are like, why would I do that? And the reason I did that is I'm a collector, just like you guys. And we saw an opportunity that the current market wasn't what we felt fulfilling what collectors want in their games. So, with my experience and my partner's experience and all my fellow uh, employees, we saw an opportunity. And that's how Labyrinth was born today. And actually, I do want to point out Barry. He's talking about uh, Big Lebowski when it launched. And uh, I remember John Papaduke uh, making a comment in 2013. And I was at Chicago that year, um, representing Globals. And Barry dropped his game. And John Papaduke said it's the Big Lebowski effect. And he was shocked. And he, what confused him the most was the rug. It's like, why are they giving a rug away with the game? But Barry understood what collectors wanted. Again, he's a collector. He's not just a manufacturer, he's a collector. So I want to talk to you today, why I'm here today, is how important the European collectors are to the pinball community and the industry itself. Um, a lot of people think America, and most of the sales are in the United States. However, a lot of people don't understand in Europe in the 90s, you guys were responsible for a lot of the orders for pinball machines. And when pinball went down, you guys had a lot of pinball machines, and most of the pinball machines in America and Australia were already sucked up by other collectors. So what we ended up doing is we needed more games because we had an addiction just like you guys. So we would get containers worth of pinball machines out of Italy, Spain, and fix them up. You know, this is all part of the addiction that we all have as collectors. So, going back a little bit more, how did I get into pinball? Actually, how many of you even heard my story at all and why I'm doing what I'm doing today? Has anyone heard my talks? One. That's good. <laughs> so, when I was 12 years old, um, I was working with my father. And uh, he was in construction and truck driving. And he'll take me to the fish and chip shop. And the fish and chip shop would have an arcade machine and a pinball machine. That's how I discovered pinball. So to my dad, being an entrepreneur he is, I was obviously gravitated to the pinball machines and arcade machines. And he was like, well, David, if you want to operate games like this, every dollar you make with me working, I will match it. Because he, at the end of the day, he didn't care about the machines. He just needed someone to help him <laughs> during the summer holidays. So I'd work all summer with him, and uh, you know I would make my money. And we went, we'd go for the news, trading newspaper, looking for arcade machines, pinball machines. And uh, my dad would be like, "Oh, well, let's go and visit these these uh, distributors and all these little uh, vendor places." And uh, we're going through them, and uh, my dad, you know, going through, and dad goes, oh look, there's this $350 cocktail video game. That, that would be a good start. Because I think he only thought of like $150. And what he didn't know, I've been working for my grandma during the summer holidays, picking fruit. So I had a war chest of about $400, $500. And there was the data in Star Wars promotion. Now, what drew me to that was the license, Star Wars. I'm a big Star Wars fan. And I told my dad, I want that. And he asked the guy, how much? It's like $800. And dad goes, well, you've only got 150 And I pull out my other money for my grandma. And dad's like, what? And so he had to pull out the extra money, and that was how I got my first game. But what connected me to that game was the Death Star. If you guys are familiar with that area Star Wars, like, I'm making the shots. But when I hit that Death Star on ball three, 
I was Luke Skywalker. And that's what connected me to pinball. I was able to do something not everyone, well, at 12 years old, I didn't know everyone could play pinball, so but I did something special. And then that led me down the rabbit hole of looking for pinball machines. So I fell in love with theater of magic. I was a magician, I love magic. So I saw theater of magic. And I was like, I was making this game do these magical things, and then I'd bring my friends over. And then I went from Data East Star Wars to Tales from the Cribs, Doctor Who, Twilight Zone. I just started collecting and buying games and put them out on location. That's where my love, and of course, I didn't know how to fix them up. So I just had to learn on the fly how to fix them up. And that's, again, get more and more involved. Eventually, I had to grow up. I had to go to school. I went to film school for 25 years. I had to sell those off to do other things in my career. And uh, I started working film and TV. I stayed in film and TV for 25 years. In fact, I still do a little bit of it on the side. And then when I got comfortable in that, I was kind of like, I would like to get those games I collected. <laughs> because I'm just sitting at a desk doing stuff and I like to do something physical. So I surprised my wife, she went away for a wedding party in the Caribbean. I drove to the middle of, uh, uh, where was it, uh, Missouri, picked up a home used Doctor Who, brought it home, she didn't know about it. She came home, there's a pinball machine on the second floor, she's like, where did this come from? Well, and then I told her more back, my whole backstory. she's like, okay, well just one. <laughs> Six months later, we had a truck, <laughs> and we were coming back from the same distributor with more games. And that turns into a container. So now I'm back into fixing games, collecting games, restoring games. And then that slowly turns into uh, Wizard of Oz is announced with an LCD display. And I'm like, oh wow, I do that for a living. There's other people companies. Maybe I can help them do display work. And that's when the cold call thing started happening. I called up, I sent emails to Joseph Jack, Stern, all the pinball companies. One person replied to me, John Popperdick, and I started working on Magic Girl, uh, a zombie adventure, Alice in Wonderland. Did that for a little while, and then the big Lepowski effect happened, Mary. <laughs> and uh, we know what happened, whoops, in the way. But I got to work with some amazing, talented people. That allowed me to take my expertise, because again, this is part-time, I'm doing this as a hobby. I started working for another people company, and then another one, and then finally I planned out my company that actually did succeed, which was Spooky Pinball, and I started doing their display work. And then I got into their game development, helping them with licenses. Again, I'm doing this because I love it. It's not about the money, it's the passion, it's telling stories, hanging out with people like you. And then eventually COVID happens. And uh, seriously, there were some life events that happened on the side of that, that paused the world. And it was one of those things of, holy crap, what are we going to do? And, uh, you know, COVID, we didn't know if the world was going to end or stuff like that. And at that time, I was like, I need to invest in myself. And I've got all these friends working in the pinball industry that didn't know what their next job was going to be. And I've been working with licenses and I had multiple licenses coming to me like, hey David, can you get this game? Can you make this into a game? Make this into a game. And I would put that out to other people I knew in the pinball industry that I had to help them out. And my friend who I sold it, my that Doctor Who I told you about, sold to him back in 2012, was like, why don't you do that yourself? And I was like, because it's stupid, and it's hard, and it's expensive. And another month will go by, I'll get more calls like for a license. David, why aren't you doing this? Again, it's, it's, it's hard, it's expensive. I've done it for eight years with Spooky, it's not easy. So I finally got to a point to stop him from arguing with me, well asking, was all right, I'm gonna sit down and do a five to 10 year plan, show you like this is not a good idea. The numbers didn't lie. <laughs> they said that if you do it well, there's an opportunity here. And we saw the market kind of fractured with multiple versions of certain games and stuff like that. And as a collector myself, I really missed the days back in the early 2000s when we didn't know what everyone was making. So there was that time of the month, Stern will drop Tron. 
And all of a sudden, all, all of us as a community would get together and talk about the new game, get the images, watch the video, talk about it, go to the launch party. That was exciting times. And I kind of felt that that started disappearing over the last three, four years. Because everyone wants to know what's going on. So with that, we were thinking about, well, what if we were a company that we didn't leak what we're going to do? And the other companies, they, they don't want their stuff leaked, but people talk. What if we made one version, so you don't have to think about, do I take the pro version or the collector's version? We want to make, as a collector myself, a game to roll them all. So the only things you want to do is an upgrade. If you want the topper, you can have the mirrored topper. If you want a mirrored back glass, you can have that. A different shooter up, sure, we can do that, but it doesn't affect the overall game. And make sure it's collectible. Again, that's why we're doing low runs. I don't want to be making tens and twenty thousands of one unit. I only have a short time of life on this planet. I would rather make ten, one thousand units because I get to make the coolest collectibles on the planet. So, backing up, with COVID, I saw my friends that didn't have that much work. I saw an opportunity to pull them together and give them an opportunity to be the best they can be. And that is how Barrels of Fun started. And this is why I'm here today. Last year, last October, we launched Labyrinth to the World. Friday 13th, 2023. Um, it was not easy getting there, but we finally did get there. And I'm happy today, we've actually just shipped our 600th game. So we're very, very proud of that. So uh, do you have any questions regarding what I just told you guys? How many of you guys have played the Labyrinths? Okay, who owns a Labyrinth here? All right, so I've got some work to do. <laughs> so, but I just want to say, it means a lot to have you guys here. And as European collectors, I feel like Europe has kind of forgotten a little bit in the pinball community. And that's why it's important for me here to let you know, and I've told Stefan this, is we are actually going into production for the European games. We got seed certification and they're properly tested. So uh, those games are gonna be heading here. They should be built in November and Stefan, he's the one that handles the logistics. He's the one that says it'll probably be January depending on some air freight. Very good question. Why Labyrinth? Why Labyrinth? So no one wanted to do Labyrinth. And I was talking to Hanson back in the day, and we're talking about the different categories they have. And Labyrinth never came up. And I got to the point, I'm looking at their list, and I, I see Labyrinth, and I remember as a kid, I loved the movie as a child. And when I saw that, I was like, I remember being really frustrated with Sarah, because every time she did something, it was the opposite than I would do. Like, you fall down a hole, you get caught by these magical hands that are talking to you, and they give you the option to go up or down. She chooses to go down. Like, who in their right mind, if you're falling down in a trap, you kind of want to go the other way. But she does the opposite. I mean, that's the whole point of the movie. She's making choices that, you know, she learns at the end she had to change. So thinking about that and thinking about the labyrinth as a whole, I thought it was an amazing opportunity to create a play field where the player can now interact with those characters. And you actually get to do the opposite of what she can do. You know, and we had full rights to use the characters and the actors and stuff like that. And I, this was a perfect opportunity to create a world where you're not playing as the protagonist or you know the, the person in the film, but this is your experience. You you could be in the labyrinth with her. She could have been years before you, even you you know years in front of you. But this was important for us to make a game with a licensor who allowed us to do this. And not all licenses will let you do what we did with Labyrinth, I promise you that. Um, but this was an opportunity to create a true world under glass. I would, they would never let me direct the film, but I realistically got to direct the sequel to Labyrinth. But it's a more personal experience, because now you can actually change the fate of your game. But I suck at pinball, so <laughs> I'm not that great. So that's why we chose Labyrinth. Was it, was it hard actually to get the license or the, the agreement from that, uh, from Hanson? Uh, uh, no, it, it's, I mean all license, every licensor has their unique way of dealing with things.
things. And they want to give you, most times they want to give you everything you want. However, times have changed. Actors retain their rights now. Music retain, the music writers retain their rights. So it's not just a single source anymore. So there's a lot of third party licensing that goes into that. So it's not just the video clips. So like on a front of licensing, you will get what they call a style guide. That'll be the logos, approved images, etc. Then it goes to the next level of how many of the actors have given their rights for merchandising, which is usually zero. So then you have to now negotiate with them to get their rights, and also you're going to get the publishing rights too. And then you then you got the soundtrack on top of that. So you usually one license usually. Re has about three to four different licensing, sub-licensing underneath that. But Henson was amazing. There was a point in our uh, approval process that they were like, you know what, David, stop asking us these all these little approvals because we've realized that you guys actually understand Labyrinth probably more than some of our merchandise people. Just send us the final piece and we'll say yes or no to it. Because they actually asked a question, there was a name, I don't remember the name, but they weren't called the cleaners. There was a name for the cleaners in the movie. And it's actually on the book in Sarah's junkyard room. And I was calling that on the label. And they said, they're, they're called the cleaners. And I'm like, yeah, but if you look on the book, on the south side, I took the still shot of the frames, like this is what it's called on the book. And they're like, huh, well, can you please make the cleaners? Just <laughs> let's just keep moving on. Um, but they were absolutely amazing to work with. So approval was a breeze? <laughs> um, most times, yes. Yeah, most times it is. And again, they want the best product to represent because, well, there's a couple licenses that see it more as making money, but in reality, they need to see it as where a marketing tool for them to create awareness about their property. And it's just, you know, there's some licenses that are, you just can't do just because of the restrictions on it. And then there's others that will just let you go. It's, it, you know, you think it would get easier over time. But it doesn't because every deal is completely different. Any other questions? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Hold on. I hope, I hope, my, I hope you don't mind uh, asking me, but are they getting rich off of you, off your back, or is it just one time fee, or is it just with every sold uh, pinball machine? Uh, I mean. So you always pay royalties. Royalties. So right. no one's making getting rich off of pinball. Um, if you ask, you know, was there better ways I could use our money to, instead of creating a pinball machine, uh, yeah, I probably could have made more money than someone else. But that's not why I'm doing this. I'm doing this because I love pinball. And, you know, with COVID and having this soul searching moment, again, my father thought my, I was unemployed and having a midlife crisis. And at the end of the day, I worked in the film industry as a service provider. And at the end of the day, if I'm not cheaper, they're going to just forget about it. No matter how good my work is, eventually you age out and they don't want to pay you. And I got a whiff of that. And to be honest with you, I saw so many talented people I've worked with before that I wanted to work with again. And the only way for that to happen was for me to invest in myself and my friends. And as long as that pays for itself, and I do this until the day I drop dead, that's what I'll do. So, now we do make money, don't get me wrong, but no, exactly. there's a lot better other investments, I promise you that. Thank you. You're welcome. Jonathan, you had something to say? Did you have something to say? No? So, me? Sorry. Yes. No, actually, I was not related, but. <laughs> Okay. So, being here in Holland has, uh, you know, this is a great opportunity again for my father to see myself, but there's a person that I have followed for a long, long time. And I've followed DPO for a while now, mainly because I have a connection to Holland. But there's a guy here who has the Dutch pinball machine, Gerard. I'd like you to come up here for a minute. Now, I haven't been to his museum yet, but I've always been amazed by it. And right, I want to give you a couple of prototype pieces. So, here is the prototype nipper rod. There. It was made for the game. There we go. 
Wait a second. Wait a second. <laughs> Here is the first moulds that we did. In fact, this one, this was actually bigger. We had to cut it off. So this is actually a working piece that we had to do to modify it. We have some direct print decals, back boxes. So this is what actually made it into production. But this is the prototype that only exists on one game. That's my game. But this is the only other direct print of that piece. So this doesn't exist anywhere else. So I want you to take this, put this in your museum. Yeah, we will. And uh, I look forward to coming and seeing you on Tuesday. Yeah. So. And we will have a game in our museum, so you can also play it in our museum. Very good. So. And uh, nice to meet your uh, father. <laughs> and he speaks fluently Dutch. Dutch? Do you speak Dutch? No, I, I can curse. Well, I can curse. Yeah, is it good to be recorded? Yeah, yeah. Can you have any swear words? No, I'm not going to that. Thanks, man. Appreciate it. Thank you. And tomorrow, um, I'm going to do a second talk, and I wasn't, I, that's not typical in America to do two talks. So the second talk I'm going to do is going to follow on from what I've just talked about here, but I'm actually going to walk you through the process of what we did to make this game. So that includes uh, prototypes, that includes the uh, some of the art we didn't get to use and so forth. Like just the process of the uh, approval process with the licensor, how we present ourselves to them, and uh, that will be tomorrow. I'll have the laptop and the PowerPoint that goes up with that. So, any other questions? Mm -hmm. I the mic. Yeah, I'll give him this one. <laughs> uh, yeah, thank you. Um, on this game, was the first game you designed? Uh, because on previous projects you were uh, on animation, so how was that change? And how did you come to make such a advanced design with all the shots being <laughs> having a secondary function as well. So this is a pretty simple uh, answer is how many people here have dreamed about building their own game? <laughs> yeah. So again, if you're a collector, you always dream about what if, what if. So many hours as I would work on getting the licenses and the animations uh, and we would be presented with different licenses all the time. So you would just sit there pencil sketching. You know, I wasn't part of the as the so-called designer at that point, but you'd still sit up there with ideas and stuff like that. And uh, I'm not a mechanical engineer. Again, my background is in film and television. But in film and television, you just got to mock stuff up. You know, you make it look real, you know. So a lot of times I would just draw stuff up, get a whiteboard. This is something I learned from John and Dennis Norman. Is like I would phone call the crap out of everything, shoot it if it played like crap, wipe it off, start again. And it was just literally, the reason why we have multiple entrances on every shot is because it's elaborate. It constantly changes on you. So it was like, how, if I had my out of orbit, how am I gonna divert that? And I had lots of really, really bad ideas. In fact, I spent two to three weeks trying to figure out how these multiple diverters work. And then my mechanical engineer who's trying to help me with this, he's just like, dude, we just need to put a magnet in the back left. That doesn't work, how can that work? And then it's like, we're arguing for 15 minutes. And then he literally showed me, he's like, oh, well that's good, they just saved us 50 bucks in the bombs, I'm good with this. So, but it's, it's all trial and error. I have no background. And that's why I encourage you guys, if you're collectors, go and get some P-Rock or fast boards. Make something, you know? I mean, you are playing electricity, be, please be careful, but it's, it's not as hard as you think it is. It just takes a long, long time, and you have a very, very patient partner. Um, you know, because my wife was getting kind of frustrated because, again, when we were building Labyrinth, she's been there since day one, and she's a she was a teacher at the time, so she was supporting the whole family. And she's like, "You're gonna go make some money," and I'm like, "I'm getting there. I'm getting there." You know, and there's been probably times that we could have launched the game earlier, but I've also seen what happens in this industry of over promising and under deliver and I did not want to do that that's why it was important for us to launch the game with games in boxes and production already begun because trust me I would love to show you everything that we were doing but what if I got sick or died 
no one's going to carry this company across the line. I mean, my team is, but again, if I, I'm not there to help them. So it was really important to us. We had to invest in ourselves so you guys believe in us. And that's still going to take time because we do kind of get lumped in where the new company, are they going to deliver all their games? Yeah, we're going to deliver the games. But you won't believe that until we're probably game three or four. You know, you may not like Labyrinth, but game two might get you. If that doesn't, game three will. So, again, I'm just making cool stuff for cool people. And I just hope you guys enjoy it too. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, so, what's the vision for Barrels of Fun? What's your, where are you going to be in 10 years? 10 years? Uh, we're going to have a lot more games out. Um, we're just not going to be doing games, we're going to be doing other collectibles down the road. But right now, what we're focusing on is making sure we deliver games. So where we will be doing, we'll be delivering probably some of the best collectible pinball machines I've ever been made. And that's not cocky stance, it's just, I believe in my team of people. And I just want to make sure I get games to you guys in a timely manner. I'm a little bit disappointed that we've only made so many games at this point. But you got to remember, back in October, I had four people working for me. I'm over 30 now. And hiring 30 people and trying to keep the line running has been an exercise I've never, ever dealt with before. Um, and it's not just you know, making sure we make a good product, having QC and things in place to make sure everyone's taken care of, but it's also the personalities. Um, because someone may have looked at someone the wrong way and now I have to get involved. You know, or a uh, vendor didn't deliver a product on time. Like, I underestimated the manufacturing side by a lot. So that was my big focus in the last six months has been getting that tightened up to make sure that we can produce games in a very timely manner. And uh, we are hitting those goals right now. Because again, who wants to wait 12 to 18 months for a game? Actually, I will say a lot of collectors do don't mind that because I want a good product, but I want to strip that down. So that's been my primary focus. So where do I see ourselves? Making really cool stuff. Thanks. So um, yesterday, uh, David was a special guest on the uh, Pitbull Magazine and Pitbull News uh, Pincast, which will be published this Monday. Uh, we had a talk prior to that, and you uh, described to me the, uh, the process if, if someone is applying for a job at your company, which I found rather interesting. Can you tell the audience what kind of questions you ask to someone? <laughs> actually, so we'll actually talk about our newest employee uh, right after this question, because he had to go through it too. Um, so when we employ people, they come in for an interview, and you ask, you ask them, what do you, got, what do you want to do with your life? What, what's your goal? And the first thing is like, oh, I, I want to make pinball machines. I'm like, no you don't. You're here to get a job. What is your personal, what do you want to do personally? They look at me really weirdly. And it's like, because I'd love for you to be here for the rest of your life. We're not looking for day laborers. We're looking for employees. I want you to retire out of this company. But in reality, that's not going to happen, potentially. So is there something I can teach you in this field that can help you move on in two years' time? You know, is it soldering? Is it uh, logistics? Is it packaging? Is it uh, sub-assembly? Is it cabinet work? And they're kind of taken back by that. And they're like, what do you mean? Actually, the biggest thing they get taken back is we have an air-conditioned facility. Uh, apparently in Houston, well, in Texas in general, 90% of all warehousing have zero air conditioning. So after I take the tour, they're like, is this AC? I'm like, yeah. Like, I can't expect you guys not to work. If I can't work in here, I can't expect you to work in here. So again, it's finding out what they want to do, how I can give them the keys to be successful. And the other thing is, is if you screw up, tell me. And I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, because if you screwed up, you need to tell us because we didn't train you properly. And that's probably been the hardest thing with all my employees is, I think it's a human nature, we don't want to be wrong. So if we screw up, kind of like, put it away, move on to the next one. And there is a financial reason for that, is if I can fix the problem on the table, that cost me maybe $20 to fix. But that goes out on the play field into, a, into the wild and I have to fix it, 
I have to get the game ship back. Now we're talking hundreds and thousands of dollars for me to fix it. But I want my employees to be comfortable on the line. I want them to be know what they're going to do. And that's probably the hardest thing to shake out of people, is making them own up to if they make a mistake. And again, at the end of the day, if you made a mistake, it's because we didn't train you correctly and we need to retrain. So we spend a lot of time going through processes. Um, right now, we hit a area of our workforce that kind of got a bit of fatigue because they get into their 500, 600 game and they get a little bit more slap happy and we had to stop the line and, hey guys, this is not acceptable. And redo it again. Um, but, you know, we celebrate everyone's birthday, we get them pizza and, you know, we have a good time. They work four days, 10 hour shifts and uh, we apply health insurance, we pay for all the health insurance and uh, we're pretty happy. And talking about new employees is, I'm going to announce today, I have a posted on Facebook, um, is, does anyone know Butch Pill? Yeah. A couple. Well, Butch Pill worked at JJP and CGC doing their manuals, mm -hmm. and he retired a little while ago. And um, I saw that come up, because mm -hmm. obviously on social media, and LTG Lloyd messages me directly. Hey David, Butch is not working for anyone anymore. You need someone to do your manuals. Everyone's asking for manuals. And I'm like, huh, that's interesting. So I reached out to uh, Butch and uh, again, he slowly retired. And I said, well, would you be interested in doing that? And guess what? He's a collector like you guys. <laughs> you think he's gonna stop working on Pitbull? No. So I said, why don't you come over? I'll pay for you to come over. Come and see the facility and let's talk. He came over and went through the facility and saw what we're doing, because he didn't know us. Like, being outside of Chicago, I think, has kind of hidden us from a lot of people. So they had no idea what's going on. He walked through the facility and was like, oh wow, this is like a real factory. Like, oh, you've got this. I'm like, yeah, this is what we're doing. And at the end of it, he goes, so, do I get a game? And I was like, of course you do. You gotta do, you gotta do the manual, need a game. So we're sitting up, we're doing the agreement, and he's like, do I get a topper too? <laughs> you know? And it's like, yes, of course we'll get you a topper. But yeah, Butch Pearl has joined the team and he's also going to be a part of the tech support as well. So when you call in on tech support, you'll get him on the phone probably the next couple of weeks. So we're super happy to have him. And again, he's like us. He's a collector. Does it really matter about the money? No, he just wants a game. And we're going to make sure he gets taken care of. He gets a salary too, don't get me wrong, but you know, he's getting his game. Any other questions? Anybody interested in working for Barrels of Fun? You gotta move to Texas. <laughs> <laughs> actually, that's not true. We actually do have a lot of remote workers as well that are full time. Um, I've got two workers down in New Zealand. They work for Weta. Uh, they're sculptors and stuff like that, and uh, filmmakers down there. Um, so a lot of my concept crew are down there. Um, Eric, our programmer, he lives in Wisconsin. So Butch is in New Mexico. So we actually do do a lot of remote working. So, and as a little treat, since you guys are here, um, and one of my things that I loved when I came to Holland was uh, French fries with mayonnaise, uh -huh. you know, croquettes, and bitter balls. So uh, hopefully in the next 15 minutes, there's going to be a ton of bitter balls coming in for you guys, for you guys for turning up. So, and just again, a part of my appreciation is to you know say thank you for inviting me here. Um, and like, I can't believe I'm doing a talk in a church in a chapel. So, uh, it's different. So, uh, but this show has been amazing. Um, it's not very, uh, what I say, clinical. It's very friendly. Like people are drinking, eating, having a good time. And uh, it's been a really good experience. All right, any other questions? You say you suck at pinball. Yes. Uh, your design is quite uh, challenging. The outlines and the 13 orbs you have to collect. So. Yeah, I've been told I've made the worst outlines in pinball, so yeah. it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Next game will be adjustable, I promise. <laughs> but uh, yeah, well, maybe not a question, but uh, there's a machine at our workplace and uh, I have been playing it almost every day for the last year, so uh, 
I really congratulate you on the on your first design. I mean, it's really so we got another Dutch spy, uh, Dutch pinball really spy impressive. here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, he's a programmer. He's a programmer. Yeah. So look, when it comes to the design, I have two mechanical engineers I have working on stuff. I have electrical engineers. You know, I've got a great pinball players. Probably the biggest mistake I made on Labyrinth was because we were so secretive. Is we had a lot of really good players play the game. So we were setting the game to meet what they were doing, and it's hard. The game is hard, and it's probably too hard. Uh, game two, I think, will be much more uh, for the casual player. But again, we now realize it's like a pool. We start out nice and shallow, and the deeper you get into it, the better it will be. So that's been one of you know the challenges and learning things. Like we've, you know, we've had a lot of success. Uh, I've learned a lot, and I'm still learning a lot. Um, like I said, the manufacturing side of it has been a huge learning curve for me. Managing 30 people has been a challenge. But I want to change it for the world. I'm making really cool stuff. And I'm excited about what the next one's going to be and the one after that. Because, you know, we're not going away. And uh, again, when we shoot something and it's bad, we rip it out. A good story on Labyrinth, there is a spinner behind the fork. And we're literally seven weeks from launch. And he goes, wow, well, the only thing this game's missing is a spinner. Like, you gotta have a spinner on a pinball machine. And I'm like, I go over to the prototype shop, pull off a spinner, where do you want it? He goes, what do you mean, where do I want it? It's like, we can still put it in. Like, just, where do you think it'll be fun? He's like, really? And he goes, he's placing it around. What about here? And I just take the screw, drive it in, we don't hook it up. He's like, shoot it. He goes, really? I was like, yeah, let's do it. He hit the shot and he's just like, oh, that's awesome. And that made it into the game. You know? Now, you do have to lock stuff in. Trust me, <laughs> you got to lock it in. But you can't be afraid of changing something. Because if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. You know? And there's still things in that game that I wish I could change. But that's a personal thing. Apart from, you know, that's a personal thing. But, you know, with everything that we're doing on this game, yeah, we're. I can't believe I'm here today talking about a stupid little idea that my wife thought I was crazy, but I guess COVID changed her mind. She was like, oh, whatever you want to do, you know. Um, I'm here standing in front of you guys talking. I mean, it's mind boggling. So. David, you have Dutch roots. Yes. So tell us about, you told already a story about your Dutch roots. Yes. You have something special. Absolutely, and I've already told them, so that's the problem. So, we hopefully, I was actually hoping to get fries because my love is uh, French fries with mayonnaise, which apparently grosses out most Americans. Um, but I have uh, bitter balls, so I want to make sure everyone gets some bitter balls. Um, bitter balls are fun. Absolutely, <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, so please grab a couple, and uh, it just means a lot that you guys, you know, wanted this little dude. We started a company because he shouldn't have, and here we are. Super proud to be here. <laughs> it's a multiple on plate. Absolutely, they're like little barrels. <laughs> So, uh, while the bitter balls are being uh, headed out, um, well, you started off as a, uh, a new company a little over a year ago. Yeah. Uh, there was a whole teaser campaign in front of, uh, before you revealed the game. Can you talk about the idea behind the teaser campaign? So, we didn't want to reveal anything, but we also didn't want to blindside people. So, we just wanted to have a little bit of fun. Um, and developing any type of game, you almost think you're ready to go, and then all of a sudden, a, it could be vendor or a license or something changes. So you have to adapt. Um, but we were never ever, we wanted to tease that the company was coming, but not the game itself. That's why you saw nothing for Labyrinth until we were ready to go. And that will be the same for every launch we're moving forward. You won't know about it until we're literally are dropping that, that week. Um, so it will be very quickly released. So it was just a campaign to make people aware that something was coming and we're going to do it right. We're going to have games and boxes. Um, and just honestly to see if we could, what type of reaction we'll get from everyone. And it was kind of funny to see a bunch of uh, pinball media experts kind of go all over themselves 
I mean, there were things in that crossword puzzle that we launched that we didn't even see that people were pulling out of it, like pizza. Pizza wasn't meant to be in there. That's how we ended up having a pizza party at the expo, because it was like, huh, there's pizza in it. Well, let's do that, because everyone went down like Five Nights at Freddy, that's what they're going to do. That's what they're, they're moving on to next, you know? So it was just to see how much traction we can get in the community. But it wasn't the best timing either, because we had other little companies. Like, we tease something, and then another pinball company or another person trying to start a company will come out and say, we're coming out. And actually, one of, them, one of the most famous ones was um, Tiltball. Like, we released something, and then he came out and said he was releasing the game. And it's like, we had no idea where this guy came from. So there was little things that we were doing, we were pulling out, other people were showing up. So it was just, it was just a campaign just to see what the community would react like. Well, we still don't know who Tiltball is. And we're, uh, that's a year ago. Yeah, well, again, I don't want to announce anything until we're ready to go. So, you know, when it comes to game two, you will see it when it's ready to rock and roll. Is that a hint? I don't know. <laughs> so, since we got a little bit of time, and I'm actually going to eat, which is rude, I would like to hear a couple of your favorite ideas for a pinball machine, like license themes. What are you excited? Anyone got any ideas? Yeah, Dark Crystal. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That wouldn't be a bad one. I mean, don't get me wrong, I would love to do that. Muppets and Ensign and all the other things. So it's uh, very so fun. Uh, is it, the, all the licensing, uh, is there going to be a pattern or is it going to be wild? Or no, I definitely don't want to create a pattern. I don't want you guys to say, you're always going to do X. Yeah. I can promise you, game two is radically different to what this game is. Yes. And then the IP after that, completely different again. And always first license, then you're gonna create a game around it. You Correct, all the license is always number one. We do not start a single thing. So a part of the process I will talk tomorrow um, regarding our development process is I always task my whole team, and this goes through to everyone in the company, is I'm gonna pitch you an idea and I want you to write five to 10 things that you remember. Not, I don't want you to watch the movie or listen to the music. First five to 10 things that come to your head, write them down. And after we've done that, we will look at everyone's comments. And usually there's five things, five to six things that is universal between everyone. And that's where we start focusing down on that's what's gonna be in the game. Because if us as a community, uh, as a group, if this is what we're connecting to, then most likely it's gonna to connect to other people that recognize the license. And that's where we focus on. And then we just go for that process moving forward. Anyone want to get up? Barry, what's your license? <laughs> you want to do? So, Matrix. Matrix, dude. Yeah. One of my favorite movies. Yeah. Same with Kill Bill. Kill Bill. I would do that as well. I've seen that very juicy. There you go. Both of them? Actually, I thought I saw uh, the programmer walking around on the floor yeah. today. So, but I was kind of starstruck, so I didn't feel like I was out. Nice. Nice. Based on one of my favorite games, World Cup Soccer. So, right there. Uh, one question about the uh, classic layout of pinball machines. <coughs> Have you ever tried uh, making a uh, dual layer pinball machine? Maybe the case will be bigger. But so you want to go to like an upper play field? Is that what you're yeah, suggesting? Yeah, yeah. Like an upper play field, but then like... <coughs> Two thirds of the of the whole case is also an upper play field. If the licensing calls for it, absolutely. There's nothing. So in the film industry side of things, uh, there's a process called we just blue sky, and we'll sit down. It's like we don't think about expenses or anything like that. But what would be best to tell the story? So if the game would require an upper play field, a lower play field, or something in the back box, we will do it. Um, I don't want to change the format of the cabinet itself, it needs to stay classic. I think it's important when you recognize a pinball machine, it looks like a pinball machine. That is as a collector that you guys connect to is the shape. You know, a, a pinball machine is an advertisement. It's like a movie, it's an attraction poster. You walk in by, all of a sudden you see the poster. Oh, that's X game, I want to see what's in there. You walk over to it and then you look down onto the play field. This is the second time you're going to get the coin drop. And then you're gonna like, oh, there's a little toy here. What does that do? What does that do? And that's how you get them to drop that first coin into the game to play it. 
So we approach it like nothing is off the table except it has to conform to the space of the machine itself. Any other questions? Well, I'm going to go eat my bitter bowls. And yeah, that's okay. I still got one. <laughs> and uh, I just want to say thank you for coming. I was uh, hoping to have my laptop working, but it's not. But I'll have it for tomorrow. And uh, I have the rule maps here. If you want to come and grab one, I'll sign one for you. Anyone that purchases the game today through Stefan or one of his dedicated uh, sales groups, I do. We have special owner pins. They got confiscated at the airport, so I have his pins right now, and I'm going to send the others with him. And uh, and also you will also you will also get a red shirt as a he's displaying right there. So we'll get make sure you guys take care of. And it's okay if you don't buy them. <laughs> and it's okay if you don't buy this game because we'll get you on the next one. But all I can say is go and play it, have some fun. Thank you guys. Yeah, thank you.